Now I'd like to invite uh, Matthew up to talk about whether problem-solving environments, and reading the abstract, I wasn't sure whether you should have an, an H in the first word or not. Um, whether this is about where problem-solving environments go, or, or whether, in fact, uh, to quote, to, 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 to misquote the blind boys of Alabama, um, all of your problem-solving environments have withered away. Uh, daylight comes and they will not stay. Anyway, um, uh, Matthew is here to talk about this. The interesting thing is, I believe this is probably the first time that uh, Onward has had a speaker who, rather than being a computer scientist, is actually from a physics department. Uh, except I'm not a physicist, but that's all right. Still, it's a bit with the same question. Anyway, welcome and we look forward to what you have to say. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so it is with an H, um, because I was quite interested in this topic, and we'll get into how I got interested in this. Uh, I, I wondered what happened to this. So this was a topic um, that was found in the literature in the 1990s and 2000s and then seems to have um, disappeared largely. And uh, I came across this in my own research and uh, it's kind of been in the back of my mind for 10 or 15 years, like what happened to this? So I wanted to explore this and that's what, how this essay came about. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, We'll talk about what this uh, problem-solving environment, or PSE, is, uh, some of the history of the research, uh, this new notebook environment that potentially is uh, the answer to this thing that they were researching before. Um, we'll look at that, and then we'll see where we might go from here based on some work that I've been doing more recently. Okay, so as I said, in the 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s, you'll find uh, a fairly vibrant community of researchers who are looking at this idea of uh, problem-solving environments. Um, and sort of the, maybe the canonical or closest to canonical definition you'll find is uh, where they're seeking to build software systems that have all of the computational facilities necessary to solve a target class of problems. And this was largely focused at uh, scientists doing computational science. Um, and uh, what we see in the literature, as I said, is that the use of this term has declined with uh, four, uh, many fewer papers now focused on these core topics of PSE research. Um, and we'll talk about the shape of the literature a little bit when I review that. Um, but the question I was most interested in is, so we kind of reached a point in this community of defining what a problem-solving environment was. Did we actually achieve that? And so that's why it's no longer of interest in the literature. We solved the problem. Well, I'm not so sure that's true. So let's take a look at that. So I really want to explore some of those ideas. Uh, the approach I took to this, and this was a great question that came up in, in the review, because uh, I had really sort of just written this as an essay, uh, kind of collecting a, a variety of thoughts together. But really what I'm trying to do here is less of an exploration of the literature itself and what happened to um, the community. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, just to provide some shape, but really what I want to do as an engineer, not a physicist as an engineer, is to create engineering knowledge. So really understand what the literature says this thing was, and then use that definition to uh, first of all think about whether or not uh, we have actually achieved um, the you know, what a problem-solving environment is and some of the maybe uh, some assertions about some of the newer technologies. Um, and then if not, you know, where could we go from here? Use it kind of as a blueprint. Okay, so how did I get here? Um, I'm an engineer. I build tools for analysts and engineers and scientists. Uh, and that has really led me to be focused on uh, my area of research and end-user uh, development, which I didn't really talk about very much in, in the essay at first. And a reviewer kind of said, hey, you ought to go look at this end-user development thing, um, which was quite uh, sort of ironic, given that that's where I started. And uh, a lot of my focus has been on how to support these scientists, engineers, and user developers in capturing the problem-solving knowledge for the work that they are doing. Uh, so they may be working on some tool. Their focus is to uh, use computers and computational capabilities to get to some solution. And in doing so, they're, they're potentially solving a new class of problems. It would be great if they could kind of document that, not only for reproducibility in the scientific literature, but also for sharing and reuse, all those good things. 
Uh, so one of the areas that I was focused on in my research was literate programming and could you apply literate programming to uh, these end user programmers? Uh, was there a way to do that? I've kind of suggest this notebook style interface. This was in the 2000s before Jupiter showed up on the scene and so um, not claiming that uh, my dissertation work led to Jupiter showing up on the scene, certainly not, um, but uh, I thought it was also somewhat ironic that just a few years after I completed uh, my uh, initial work, uh, all of a sudden notebooks are everywhere, everybody's very enamored with them and they're, they're taking over. Um, and that's also the time we see this decline in the literature about problem solving environments. Um, and that was kind of the sort of the interesting, is there a correlation here? And of course now recently, and we've had a number of talks at this conference and other re recent conferences uh, about how these intelligent agents, uh, particularly large language models or LLMs, um, can also provide a mechanism for end user development. Okay, so I already gave you this uh, definition. Um, and uh, there's a couple of, I'd say, these high-level formulations of what a problem-solving environment is in the literature. Uh, Hustis and Rice, and these are papers around 2000 or so, um, define one as natural language, so an interface that you uh, interact with through natural language, and they really mean the language of the domain you're working in. Um, a set of solvers or computational components that you can then assemble to solve your problem. Some kind of intelligence in the environment that helps you in doing all of that. And then this idea of a software bus where you can connect all the pieces together. Um, there was an earlier formulation of this same thing uh, that they had where they talked more generally about a user interface. And this was, let's say, in the, in the mid-90s or so where we're thinking about graphical user interfaces or how that was just sort of the, the era of the first graphical user interfaces. Um, a more general term for solver is the libraries, which I actually like more. This idea of a knowledge base, which also spoke to me because, again, thinking about capturing that problem-solving knowledge. And then a mechanism for integration, uh, also a term that I, I sort of prefer to software bus, which I think if you think about the early 2000s, the software bus uh, was very much sort of a, a term that was in vogue, but I think integration talks more to the problem at hand. So I really like both of these together and choosing a, sort of the, the right pieces to explain what we're talking about. That was their formulation. The way I looked at this problem was I took uh, uh, that paper and uh, like two to three other papers from the literature that talk about problem solving environments and what the future would look like. And these are all around the time period of 2000, which is just about in the middle of um, the, the period where there was a, a lot of research on these. And so you can see what each of these uh, papers uh, kind of talks about and the different focus that they came from. Some were coming from the infrastructure side, grid computing. Um, others were just thinking very broadly about what the future might look like. And what I did with these papers was I went through, and uh, you don't need to try and read this table. I'm going to go through each of the, the, the rows uh, just to give you a sense of what they are. This is in the, the, the paper. Um, but each one talked about these ideas, and there's maybe seven or eight ideas here uh, that they all talk about. Sometimes they use different terms for the same idea, and sometimes they use the same term to talk about it differently. And so I pulled out some quotes from the paper to, so, to give you a flavor for that. I'm going to walk through these now quickly just to give you a sense of what the features of a, a problem-solving environment might be. Okay, so the first, and this is the one that they all talk about, and they all agree is probably the most important thing, and this is this idea of enabling the users to interact in the problem domain. Um, and so the goal is to close the gap between the problem domain and uh, your ability to express the solution computationally. So if you're a chemist, you ought to be able to speak in the language of chemistry, state your problem, and then a bunch of uh, things in the system, compile that into the appropriate computations, pull those solvers together and help you, um, you know, execute the experiment. Um, and this is really then where you get this idea of uh, end user programming and trying to help people who are just trying to get something done with a computer um, to be able to program it. And so uh, Casavilli, who also publishes quite extensively in um, the end user programming community, uh, talks about this idea of how, you talk, how domain experts, what their needs are. So quite often what they need to do is just set parameters for something. Uh, think about this as filling in the parameters to a function or a form. 
type course and end user programming, you'll see form-based uh, methodologies as, a, as an approach to doing that. And then also doing some kind of modification to the software, um, maybe changing how the pieces are integrated, sometimes extending that. Again, these are ideas from um, uh, end user program, but the focus is to try to make this as close as possible to the human, to the domain that they're thinking in. Uh, there tends to be this aversion to text-based approaches, and so in the early days of this you'll see a lot of graphical approaches, visual programming language, particularly in the sciences, these became very, very favored, and you'll see that in, in grid-based computing as well. And so this is an example of what a problem-solving environment might uh, look like. Uh, this is um, uh, one of those environments. Uh, uh, it's actually still available. I think you can go and, and download this. Um, but you see there's a lot of these sort of graphical description of the system. There's some places to fill in different inputs. And then you get a visual output. So it's input your uh, specification for the problem in some sort of graphical way. And then the output is usually some type of scientific rendering. Okay, another idea here was the need for multidiscipline and collaboration support. Um, very often uh, there's this need for, uh, in, in a complex scientific environment, uh, scientists and even engineers that come from different disciplines to work together. So if you go back to the previous um, point where we're talking about enabling a scientist working in one discipline, again I said chemistry, now think about how they might need to work with somebody if you're doing uh, a problem that is both chemical in nature but also biological. They tend to speak somewhat different languages and you'd want the system to provide them with an interface in each of their own languages but then be able to work together. Uh, and so there was some work on how you could do this and this idea of allowing flexible interfaces so that you got the interface that you needed for the problem you were going to solve. Kind of keep that in mind when we start talking about notebooks in a little bit. The idea of being able to share uh, artifacts and find artifacts when you're speaking one language and a scientist in another domain is speaking another language. How do you find each other's artifacts? Uh, this idea of intelligent support throughout the problem-solving process. Um, again, we're thinking about end users. Uh, they're focused on solving a scientific or an engineering problem. They're not focused on uh, twiddling command line parameters and all the other little things you need to do to actually make a computer uh, uh, program work in practice, especially a complex one. And so during the we see that there's a number of places throughout the process that uh, intelligence support can be useful. Early in the process, it might be in helping the users formulate the problem during the process, the software development process. And so this is where we see, at least in the early phase, most of uh, the support for this. It's the idea of recommender systems. You've kind of told me what you wanted you want to do, I'm going to go and find pieces of software that can help you do this. And then during execution, the ability to deploy to distributed infrastructures, handle all of those sort of computational things that this, the scientist doesn't actually care about, they just want their solution to run. Um, and then also maybe helping to capture some of the insights and share new knowledge. Um, and as I mentioned, this idea of problem solving, knowledge capture and sharing, uh, you saw that in the, in the description there was both this idea of a knowledge base, but then also the ability to share information. Um, the whole point of what the scientist is doing is to create knowledge. Now they're focused on maybe exploring some hypothesis and uh, creating some type of uh, scientific result, but again, in the process of doing that, they're creating problem-solving knowledge. This happens in multiple domains at the same time, though, almost every time one of these problems is executed. So there's, again, that scientific domain, but there's a software engineering piece, too. The end user is building some type of a software artifact, and there's a, a, quite a few challenges in just underlying computer science. How to how do you answer some of the challenges of integrating different components and a number of the other uh, computer science type of um, questions. And so there's knowledge that is generated throughout this process that is worth capturing and sharing. Uh, of course, software sharing and reuse is 
good. Um, I don't think anyone would argue with that. Uh, it makes the problem easier if the scientist, when they come to the problem solving environment, has that toolbox, that set of libraries, the set of solvers already available to them. Those things have to come from somewhere and they have to be uh, plug and play. Um, and so you need a component framework to help you do that, but then you actually need the actual libraries and you need to be able to find them. It has to, they have to be discoverable. And if you imagine this being distributed across uh, the web, uh, which again, remember in the 90s is, is uh, really coming into play for uh, the scientific community, uh, making that possible is a significant challenge. Again, I just mentioned components. Focus on the components themselves, on a component model. Again, think about the 1990s. This was, uh, you had various uh, PORBA and other object uh, component um, models that were uh, all vying for attention at the time and uh, certainly played a role here too. There was a number of common types of uh, components that you would expect to find in these environments. Clearly, the computational components, usually uh, ordinary differen differential equation solvers and those sorts of things, visualization components. But then there would also be domain-specific components. Again, if you're working in uh, chemistry or biology, you would expect to have very specific algorithms focused on the work that you're doing and have those available to you. Another idea is experiment management. Uh, two pieces here. One is this a concept of being upfront in the process to do what effectively is a design of experiments. Um, but then during the actual computation, there's a whole sub-genre of this literature about computational steering that uh, is also part of the grid computing community. And uh, this is the idea, if you're not familiar with this, of if, as the computation is uh, running along, you, you see that maybe it's not going quite where you want it to go, uh, and in order to save resources, you might vector it uh, toward a, a better solution. So there's sort of an interactive component to this, and the idea of how much can the computer, the system, help you with this process. And so the problem-solving environment is um, envisioned as a, win a front end to enabling the, the uh, computer scientists to do this. Okay, and then the last piece is uh, the computing architecture and infrastructure. A lot of the community that was involved in this work came out of high performance computing and grid computing also, which were growing uh, quite a bit at the time. A key challenge here is, um, being, is resource management. Uh, how do you share resources among many scientists and engineers who are essentially competing to have their problem run first? Uh, so how do you make use of those? And how do you even deploy the thing that, they, that has come from that high-level description into some kind of compiled form onto the grid just to execute? Again, uh, the end-user programmers here are not, uh, not experts in doing that, so you really have to facilitate them for that. And again, the PSC is seen as a high-level interface to this infrastructure. Okay, so um, what does this analysis of the literature help us do? Um, I would argue five things. Uh, the reason I spent some time thinking about this. Um, first, it provides us a view of the community's collective thoughts. Not necessarily a consensus view in all cases, and again, you can see in the details in the table where there's a, maybe a little bit of divergence on some things, but you get a sense of what is a problem-solving environment, what were they all after, even if they were coming at it from different perspectives. You can see how different terms and ideas and elements were introduced, how they were realized in implementations, and how they may have involved, evolved and even gone out of favor over time. It gives you a, a model for a class definition for what a problem solving environment is. So we can then use that as a model to look at something that somebody claims is a problem solving environment and see whether or not it really is and we're going to do that shortly. You can use it to compare alternatives. So you'll see at least in one of the papers um, in, in the, in the, about computational notebooks they talk about uh, the design space for computational notebooks. And um, it's a really nice paper because it gives you a sense of what are all these elements that people have thought about that ought to go in here and what's, what works better for certain circumstances versus another. I think you can do the same thing here. And finally, the goal was to provide some engineering knowledge, a prescription of sorts. If you were going to go and start from scratch and build one of these things, how would you do this? 
just a couple of other comments from the literature. Um, one of the things that's really uh, missing in that whole list, if you're familiar with computational notebooks and data science, is data preparation. There's really very little discussion of that, largely because of the sources of data at the time and um, how uh, scientists and engineers were using these tools. And so there wasn't really a, really a lot of capability there, which is very different from what you would see in a notebook. And another idea was this idea of uh, meta-PSEs, a meta-problem solving environment. So this is a problem solving environment for building problem solving environments. Essentially you would, uh, and there was some experimental work on this, you would, you would specify, well, what's the kind, the class of problems that I want to solve, and then this thing would generate a problem solving environment for you uh, that would help you do that, um, instead of being just a generic one. Um, so I think that remains to be a, a, a kind of an interesting question. Okay, so let's take a little bit of uh, time to look at the, the research. As I said, um, it spanned about 25 or so years from the mid-1980s to about 2010 or so. Um, and so in the early days, uh, in the, by the mid-90s, um, you got to the point, as you can see in this one quote here, where if you were making a research, a computational research proposal, it was essentially expected that you would be proposing a problem-solving environment. Uh, so it, it really did have quite a bit of prominence, and like I said, there was a fairly significant research community around it. And so this comes out of one of the papers that goes up to about, that was published in 2000, and it was um, uh, an analysis of the bibliography, uh, actually in another paper that had been collected, uh, just to show the, the publication dates. You can kind of see uh, the number of publications going up here from the mid 80s. Um, so what I did was just to see what happened to this, because this is just like we're going up and up, is what happens when you then look at the rest of uh, time, and you know, to my hypothesis, uh, things start to fall off there after about 2005. And so the question is, well, what's going on? Um, and what does, this, what does this actually look like? Uh, so what, when we look in the literature, we see there's two categories of literature. The first, I'm going to call this application-oriented research. And so this is where uh, usually a scientist or a scientist working with a computer scientist has developed a solution to a problem, and they've uh, captured that in the form of a problem-solving environment. So this is an instance of a problem-solving environment or a claim of an instance of a problem-solving environment. And that, was, that makes up most of the literature. Um, and then there's another portion of the literature that talks about the uh, general discussion of what problem solving environment technology and infrastructure are. So the four papers that I uh, talked to before are an example of that kind of paper. And this is really about how you engineer and build these things and what are they. It's answering those kinds of questions. So we look at the kinds of application domains in the first category, clearly the sciences, engineering, um, but also decision support, uh, make, how, building tools for helping people solve decision-making problems, uh, a lot in the area of mathematics, um, and then more analytical problems like geospatial, flood prediction, land use, a lot in, in that area. In the second category, we see that the researchers come from a number of different backgrounds. So there wasn't, they didn't, there wasn't a problem-solving environment uh, uh, core research community that was born that way. They came from different disciplines and they were collaborating. And so what we found is a lot of them came obviously from scientific computing, uh, the, the grid or high performance computing um, community also was quite involved in this. And then uh, data analysis, e-learning, and some other non-computer science applications of computing uh, was another place we found many of these researchers. Okay, so now let's jump uh, to this idea that maybe these problem-solving environments went away because of the rise of um, computational notebooks, which came on the scene in the, in the tw around 2010. Um, so the, initially, IPython, uh, if you remember that, was introduced around 2007, but really started to pick up um, with growth, I would say, in 2010, 2012, thereafter. And what this 
environment does, if you haven't seen this, is a web-based environment. It connects to a Python or other language backend. Um, and it's a very open environment that just exposes all the aspects of computing scientific code. It's very uh, interactive. It's, it's essentially like a, a repo for um, doing scientific computing. Uh, very good integration of uh, GUIs and visualization libraries and a lot of access uh, via those libraries to parallel and distributed computing backends. Uh, so it serves as a front end to a, a lot of different capabilities. And um, sort of the pictures on the left are the, what that looks like, uh, what Python looks like, if you, or IPython or Jupyter looks like, if you haven't seen that. You, it really built on this notebook style interface that was popularized by Wolfram Mathematica, which of course is still available. Um, and uh, it's the idea where you put in a little piece of code and then you execute that and then the result comes out and it may be a text result or a visual, visual result, it may be interactive. Uh, so it's a very natural way to, to interact with a problem um, and to kind of work through that and, and get a solution. So what are some of the features of these? Uh, they, these notebooks interleave code and text and visualizations in this linear flow. So this is really building on that uh, Knuth idea of literate programming. Uh, some of the common features, easy access to data sources. I'll say easy there in the sense of um, it's possible. Uh, code editing uh, in one or more programming languages, more recent notebooks have enabled uh, multiple language uh, poly polyglot work. Um, the ability to execute code on the fly and get the results, and then the ability to publish this. This is really a key idea, that you can do your work in a notebook and you can then publish it. Uh, now, are people publishing these as papers? Not necessarily. There's some technologies that allow you to do that, but uh, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't actually work out in practice. Um, and so some of the core objectives, making, this, making these tools very accessible, so this sounds a lot like a problem-solving environment, sharing, reproducibility. Um, and what we're, the goal here is to create these computational narratives to explain the work as you're going, and very much like what, you, uh, what Knuth describes in literate programming, but in this case, it's about the problem you're solving as opposed to the program itself, or at least more about the problem you're solving in theory. Um, and increasingly, as I said, these are programming language agnostic. Okay, however, in practice, in the literature in the last five or so years has started to see papers talking about, okay, now we have these things, many data scientists and scientists and engineers are using it. Um, how is that working in practice? And uh, what we see in practice is it doesn't necessarily match the vision and the design. And so uh, there's a number of different papers out there. I chose uh, one that does a pretty good job here of just walking through some of the challenges. Uh, as I said, data is accessible, but loading it, especially across platforms, is, is still kind of difficult and time consuming. People are constantly tweaking their code. Uh, the nonlinear execution order in a notebook is uh, extremely confusing to most users. Um, I teach a data science course really aimed at technical leaders, and uh, what we find in there uh, is they get confused by this all the time. They'll execute a cell and a prior cell hadn't been executed and then they cannot reason at all about what is going on in the program. Um, code management, kind of difficult. This, most of the code management is in the underlying libraries and those underlying ecosystems like Python, which they, each one is different and very complex. Um, and so sharing is also very challenging. Uh, in that sense, and it makes that thereby makes reproducibility uh, kind of challenging. Also, people can customize their environment, so when they go to share their notebook to somebody else, it doesn't work. Um, and deploying a notebook is also fairly challenging, again, because of the ability to have different environments and customizations, and uh, it really depends very much on the underlying infrastructure uh, that you've set and configured. Most of those things are beyond most users' skill sets. Because again, we're really targeting people who are not programmers. Another thing to highlight here, of course, is that you're expected to program in Python or R or something. So you're pretty far away from the, the, um, your domain language, necessarily. A key interest of mine, as I said, was how do we capture this problem-solving knowledge in a really significant objective um, uh, was this idea of this using literate programming to explain what is going on. Um, in practice, though, several studies have found that uh, scientists do not do this. 
Um, so this one study here is just an example. I uh, looked at over a million notebooks that are available online, and um, a fair number didn't have any narrative at all. It was just code, so they just completely skipped that. And then when they talked to users, uh, what they found is uh, these are more like computational scratch pads. People go in, they do some work in there, they might put a few notes, those might be notes in themselves. They're not really intended for other people to read. Okay, so let's uh, like take a look at whether or not uh, Jupyter and let's just say computational notebooks in general are problem solving environments. Um, it has been argued, and this was one of the things that sort of spurred my interest in this, uh, that Jupiter is the solution to the, the problem solving environment um, and we don't we need to look no further and so this is a an, an introduction actually to um, uh, in, in introduction to uh, computing and science and engineering uh, that talked about this idea and you can kind of see the argument they're making is hey we've already done it we've realized what a problem solving environment is and it's called the Jupiter ecosystem and again, just generally computational notebooks, but that's really the biggest one there. So let's kind of walk through those. I'm going to do it very quickly, uh, those eight ideas uh, from problem-solving environments, and let's see how computational notebooks stack up. Uh, so problem-domain interaction, uh, I already mentioned this uh, briefly, computational notebooks are very much focused on traditional text-based programming languages, Python and R are the two big ones, but there are computational kernels for almost any language in there. Um, sometimes there's some support for domain relevant notation. Mostly you're expected to be a Python programmer though. Multidisciplinary and collaboration supports. Well, the lingua franca here is uh, again Python or R, wherever the underlying code is. Um, there's two kinds of uh, collaboration that I should mention. One is this horizontal collaboration. This might be between the scientists or engineers in different disciplines working on the actual problem. There's also an idea of vertical collaboration. This is the uh, computer sci the uh, scientists and engineers working with computer scientists who may be implementing the computational solution to the problem, uh, the libraries, the underlying pieces, and they need to communicate as well. Um, so this kind of helps them in the sense that we're talking computer code here, um, not necessarily uh, helping the computer science, or the scientists and engineers though. Okay, intelligent support throughout the problem solving process. Uh, again, we fall back to we're essentially in a programming environment. These adopt many of the latest uh, technologies that you'll find in integrated development environments like code completion, language server protocol. Um, that's all wonderful. It doesn't really help you solve your problem. It helps you write better code maybe, but it's not really a problem solving mechanism. Um, really doesn't help you either in problem solving knowledge capture and sharing. The notebook enables you to do literate programming. It enables you to document your work and make it shareable. But as we saw, most users do not do this. It also doesn't really help with uh, software sharing and reuse. Uh, most of the software sharing and reuse is underneath the hood uh, in the, at the level of the libraries that um, uh, might be shared, for example, in the, in the Python ecosystem. You can share notebooks. It's not easy. Uh, most of the sharing that I have seen happen in practice is at the cell level. People will take a snippet of code and share it with somebody else. Here's a snippet for one cell or a couple of cells, uh, and that's about as good as it gets. Component integration, again, uh, very much driven by the underlying ecosystem you're working in. If you're working in R, then you integrate things in R. And in fact, uh, in Jupyter itself, uh, notebooks, then a single notebook itself is uh, only a single language at a time, <coughs> generally. Uh, so integrating across these is um, really a, uh, an exercise in writing some data out, maybe going to another notebook in another language and bringing the data in. Uh, not very integrated. Experiment management is 100% do-it-yourself. The notebook doesn't provide any support for this. Uh, computing architecture, there's some good uh, libraries that will help you do grid computing and things like that. You might need to know a thing or two about how to use them. It's not really built into the notebook. Okay, so overall what we observe is that uh, computational notebooks excel at providing e easy access to programming languages, software libraries, and visualization components. 
Um, they do not really do this at the domain level, though, for, that the users are operating in. Um, so could we say that Jupyter is providing all the computational facilities necessary to solve a class of problems? I don't think so. I think there's remains some gaps. OK, so then back to our uh, original question, where do we go from here? Um, there's probably a lot of opportunities about how to tackle this problem. There's two that I think stand out uh, today, given where technology is and what we could potentially do with it. So one is interactions in the problem domain language and helping bridge that gap. We've sort of seen with computational notebooks, uh, they've gone all the way back to traditional programming languages uh, from where problem solving environments were trying to provide that domain specific um, uh, interface. Maybe there's a place we can meet in the middle. I'll talk about some work that I've done there. And then intelligent support throughout the problem solving process. I uh, couldn't have a talk without talking about a large language model, so we'll just do that. Okay, so um, in terms of interacting in the problem domain language, the challenge here is making a problem solving environment uh, that is essentially a one-off, right? It's focused on a specific problem or maybe a class of problems and um, it's not necessarily very cost effective. The problem environment changes rapidly. Uh, it's very hard to maintain, I think. So there's probably a lot of reasons why that's not good. So you still want to try and find a general solution, but it has to be above the level of programming in Python or, or something. Um, and so one of the things we've been looking at is, uh, can you use this idea of conceptual modeling? Can you model a problem at the conceptual level and then use that as a framework for translating that into uh, some kind of underlying solution. This has actually been done quite a bit in the modeling and simulation community uh, where they focused on using conceptual models to uh, think through how you would model out a simulation um, experiment and then implement underneath that. So this, this gives us the right framing um, and I think what we need to do is make this more available. Um, so I've done some initial work uh, thinking about how you do use diagrams as code. This was recently presented at uh, VLHCC this year. Um, just to try to start to think about how do we enable a, a scientist or an end user to capture a model at a high level. Uh, let's stick to some text uh, because people like, seem to like text. Um, and then be able to use that to translate, start to translate that into or apply the computational components to it, uh, apply intelligence to it. Um, so we've started to think about how conceptual modeling might be a, an approach to doing that. And there's been some other parallel work uh, that we're building on that I, I think um, fits into that pretty well. And then the other piece, of course, is intelligence support throughout the problem solving process. Uh, like I said early on, this was about uh, mainly recommender engines. Um, if you think about how far we've come with recommender engines since uh, around 2000, uh, they're quite a bit better now, and so I think uh, there's some more recent technologies that could be very helpful here. Uh, but of course, there's been a number of talks on how large language models can be used to write uh, computational code, uh, even narrative and documentation, explain how a problem might be solved, how you might decompose that problem into sub-problem pieces, uh, how you can, there's been work on uh, using large language models to coordinate with external tools and build uh, essentially chains of tools. Uh, so there's a huge space of opportunity here that I think uh, could be explored. And there's already been some initial very promising experiments, uh, in, and we're talking in the last six months or so. Uh, so this is definitely an actively uh, growing area. Okay, so we've made some progress toward the vision. I think this vision of a problem-solving environment helping those end users in uh, sciences and engineering remains very worthy. So what are some of the next things we can do? I think think of thinking more about how we make that translation, better problem-solving uh, and structuring. Um, and then also really leveraging these rapidly emerging artificial intelligence technologies. And I have time for, I think, some questions. Indeed. Thanks. 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 Hi, uh, I have two unrelated questions. Number one is, uh, what about spreadsheets? Spreadsheets ah. are also a problem-solving environment yep. very widely yep. used. Yep. And can we find a middle ground between spreadsheets and notebooks? And the second one 
is I'm a huge fan of the diagrammatic approach, uh, but it kind of tends to break down once you have more than like sure. a few dozen nodes. Yep. Any ideas about navigating large diagrams? Sure. Uh, I love both of those questions. So the spreadsheet, um, uh, the spreadsheet base piece, uh, in fact, the the paper from VLHCC, um, the design of the system behind that is essentially a, uh, think about it as a cell at a time spreadsheet. So it's very much a reactive system. You put some code in and you see that uh, things like Microsoft Excel are evolving in this direction, right? You can write Python in a cell in, in, in Excel now. Uh, so I see a convergence there. Um, in that paper, I talk about a number of uh, thoughts about how you make uh, the spreadsheet paradigm more effective for scientific computing. I agree that the a spreadsheet is a general purpose problem solving environment. It's maybe a little too general purpose and it's also not well suited to scientific computing, particularly if you want to do statistics. Um, so I completely agree that that would be a, a, a great place to go. Diagrams, uh, again, the, the point that you make is exactly the reason that many visual languages sort of fell out of favor. As soon as you get beyond a few dozen nodes, you get spaghetti all over the place. Nobody can reason about it. It doesn't fit on the screen anymore, uh, and it becomes very problematic. Um, the, the approach that we would propose and that you actually see emerging in the architectural community with uh, things like the C4 model is hierarchies. Right? So you start with a very high level hierarchy and then you break down, you decompose the problem and you're going to get, um, you're going to get um, diagrammatic models that are you know, hopefully constrained. I think there's a good research question there about a heuristic, about whether or not that's the right, you know, what you can kind of manage is the right size and if the problem is bigger than that then maybe you need to decompose it some more. It's almost like a code smell kind of thing for diagrams. Um, I think there's some so good something research. Something like, like zooming in and out of maps. Yeah. Which they have a lot of heuristics for deciding what detail to omit. Exactly, exactly. So I think there's a lot of work to do there. Um, I, a lot of what I, I work with a lot of systems engineers, and they love the many you know, kinds of systems engineering diagrams. And you know, sooner or later, you get these huge spaghetti plots that I, I'm not sure are particularly useful uh, for the actual purpose. And I think there's a, you know a corresponding set of work on how do you use those effectively. Yeah. Great questions. Thank you. I love the talk. Yeah. I love the talk. Um, I think it's a really, really interesting question of sort of why that graph looks the way it is. And I'm wondering how much you've thought about just the Occam's razor uh, version, which is just, you know, the internet emerged and all of the programming done in the 90s was totally incompatible with the new runtime. Like how much are we just sort of rebuilding hundreds of millions, billions of lines of code on top of a new runtime architecture? Uh, that that's a good question too. Um, so I would I would say that uh, if you look at the time period of this literature, a number of things that I mentioned it briefly were happening. Um, the internet in the 1990s was emerging. Uh, you had computational grids. There was a great question from one of the reviewers because I made a comment uh, I think in the paper about. Um, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the scientists started writing their own code, uh, which was a new thing. That's because most people think it's because of the desktop computing revolution, right? Um, and actually, Stephen Wolfram, just a few weeks after that, actually talked about that in one of his podcasts. And, and of course, he was talking about Mathematica. Um, and it kind of relates to that, that uh, movie, Hidden Figures, about the, the, the programmers who, you know, the actual human computers who used to actually write the code. Uh, so all of these changes were happening at about the same time and you saw a number of these things and I think about the different kinds of object models and every, all this stuff that was going back and forth and then by the, about the end of the 2000s, 2010 or so, a lot of things started to stabilize out. I think we are rewriting things over and over. I think there's been a number of talks here and at other conferences recently uh, that argue for simplicity because we've generated so much complexity these users don't want to see all that complexity. I mean, I see my students struggle with the Python ecosystem and just how do I even get the right, uh, you know, VN and all this. It's terrible. Um, that takes your time away from focusing on solving actual problems. 
Uh, so I agree, we really should be, as a community of engineers, focused on how do we make that better. Uh, agree that the infrastructure problem is far too complex right now. Hi, <clears throat> this, is, this is maybe tied in a little to the answer to your previous question, but um, does, uh, it feels to me like small talk might be a good fit for this sort of thing. Is there a reason people don't use small talk for this or are people using small talk for this? So this was a great, this was also a question from one of the reviewers. Uh, very early on, if you look in the, the mid 80s, 85 to 89 period, small talk and Lisp were the primary focus of this community. Um, and for some reason, they just didn't catch on, right? And there's a, lot of, you could, there's a lot of discussions you can have. I think I went and I found a quote from Alan Kay about why small talk just broadly did not catch on. Um, but the small talk in particular was very much focused on this idea of how do I represent domain things and objects and make them very uh, usable and interact and provide that interaction with the whole environment there. Uh, seems like it should have worked, it just didn't. I don't know, I couldn't really find anything that said specifically why I think the community just kind of went in a different direction in general, just even as small talk sort of fell out of favor. Um, but you're right, uh, it, that was really the original idea to, to use those languages. Thank you. <coughs> Do you have any thoughts on HyperCard and HyperTalk? I'm sorry? HyperCard. Oh, HyperCard. Any thoughts on that? Um, that's another environment that I, I really like, and of course uh, that was influenced by Smalltalk and, and uh, some of that uh, um, thought process. Um, and in fact, in the again, the, the conceptual models tool um, that I've proposed, it is essentially kind of a one card at a time view of the world, which the, the idea there is to fo enable the user to focus on a piece of computation at a time uh, and solve a piece of the problem at a time and represent it however that needs to be best represented. So it, again, I think the paradigm of the a stack of cards, and I would say you probably need a more hierarchical organization, um, but that paradigm I think is ex exactly right. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, regarding the comment by Magnus here, uh, there is uh, the Glamorous Toolkit and the uh, Think People, uh, and when I usually read uh, uh, Tudor Girva talking about it, uh, he usually speaks about uh, not one narrative, but many narratives collabor uh, collaborating, uh, reproducible research, and uh, explorable explanations. Uh, it seems like like there is like uh, it's coming back. That's the feeling I get. It's like the, it's a mom we have this momentum where all these tools for thought and uh, I don't know if you have this same uh, feeling as well. Uh, I agree. There's a number of communities, tools for thought, uh, and um, some of these. I actually just saw another paper today that was published about a you know these. Uh, toolkits for scientific publication that have the underlying computation built in. Um, so really taking a different, similar but different approach to notebooks where you, you're building the computation but it's really toward the end of producing the, the, the scientific paper and making that reusable. Um, explorable explanations. Uh, there's a number of these things going on. I think these are all related for sure. Um, I'd love to, to to really pull the whole collection of things together because when I talk about this, it's usually one piece or another piece, but they very much are related, so I think that's a, a very valid observation. Yes. So, um, at this point, we are now five minutes late for the pastry, no. so I suggest we thank the speaker, uh, those who would like to go. 